morning and welcome to Scarborough Community Alliance Church. We are so glad that you're able to join us on this special day. On Good Friday, we remembered how Jesus took our brokenness and our sins upon himself to demonstrate his love for his children by dying on a cross. But today, on Easter Sunday, we celebrate the truth that Jesus conquered the grave, he has overcome evil, and he is victorious. Church, this is the foundation of our faith, that because of Christ, we have a relationship with the Father and the gift of the Spirit. So as we enter into a time of worship this morning, may our praise be filled with thanksgiving and joy.
This next song may be new to you, but it talks about the freedom that we have in Christ because he bore our sin and shame. Galatians chapter 5 verses 1 reads, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Let us proclaim this truth that, yes, indeed, we are free from eternal darkness and shame, and now in his glorious light. Let us continue our worship. You broke my chains of sin and shame. Well, thank you, Lori and Tim, for starting us off on Easter Sunday morning for this service. We are so glad that we have five people to be baptized in just a few moments. Baptism doesn't save a person. Only through faith in Jesus Christ is a person saved. 
But baptism is something that we do out of our obedience and love for Jesus Christ. Normally, we baptize people through full immersion in our Christian and Missionary Alliance. But today, because of the COVID-19 protocols from the province and from um, uh, municipally, uh, we are not able to do full immersion. So we will be uh, baptizing our five candidates by sprinkling this morning. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's because it is the will of Jesus that we step forward into the ceremony of baptism. So enjoy the baptisms. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alfred. And uh, growing up, I uh, wasn't raised in a Christian household. And so I never really knew much about God. Uh, I did have some friends who were uh, Mormons, but uh, I felt um, it was just a lot of uh, rules and kind of some odd things that they couldn't do. Um, also, growing up, I often heard people say things like, well, you know, if there is a God, um, why do bad things happen? And just not having the answers, uh, I guess it just made me wonder, uh, wonder more and, and believe less. Um, it wasn't really until my brother, who had gotten saved, um, that I started to become more open about hearing about God. After he got saved, I had started seeing changes in him uh, because throughout my childhood, um, I guess you could say my brother didn't really hang out with like the most righteous people. Um, and I saw my brother start to change uh, the type of people he associated with and uh, change the way he acted and treated people for the better. Um, however, on the outside, I still didn't really want to show that I was really open to it. Um, and a few years went by. Um, I'd finished college and continued to work a couple part-time jobs. Um, I went to college for fitness and health and uh, really so I could help other people uh, um, you know, live healthier and better lives uh, through personal training. And looking back, I did enjoy doing that, um, but I just felt like overall I wasn't very happy. Um, I would get angry easily, uh, and I just really felt like I wasn't progressing in my life. Um, at that point, I had started to attend some um, self-development and leadership conferences uh, back in September of 2012. And after uh, the conference, um, there was an optional Christian uh, church service that I decided to attend. And it was really at that time that I learned um, that being a Christian was not just a bunch of rules of do's and do nots, um, but actually that when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you not only receive eternal life, but you enter into a relationship with God. And I'd also had the thought that only God could heal any wounds that I had in the past and fill any voids in my life. And I wanted to start having a relationship with him. So in September 2012, I ended up accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And that was the beginning of my new life in Christ. I thank God for his grace and patience and pray that he would continue pouring out his transforming power. Thank you for hearing my testimony and witness my baptism. Amen. Alfred, because you have proclaimed your faith before God and before all of these witnesses, today it is my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lillian. For me, there are too many things to write about my conversion to Jesus Christ. I have been living in Toronto almost three years. This month was my third time moving to a new place to live. Step by step, I began to like this city more and more because I have gained more experiences about the uh, culture, people, system, and the most importantly, God. This is the city where God has been looking after me, and I can see that God's blessing is everywhere. 
God has shown me His mercy and great deeds. There are too many things happened and changed in these two years. Not only me, but also this world. Since the coronavirus spread, border closed, and airplane cancelled. As a result, I was unable to go back hometown to visit my parents. I miss my parents very much. At the beginning, I lived with constant fear. I didn't know how to protect my daughter from danger physically and emotionally. I didn't know how my parents stay safe. I feel depressed when positive cases in cities increase faster and faster. However, I had much more time to stay home and study Bible, so I started praying and praising God more, and I really enjoy reading His words carefully, meditate and longing for. God also used His way to tell me four words: lay off my fear. It is true, when I feel scared, I read the Bible and keep on praying. God's words are powerful. And he brings a strong peace to my heart. Before I came to Canada, I was an unhappy people, even though I had a very nice job. And when I immigrated to Canada and landed in Toronto, 2018, I knew nothing about God, and was found, found, for, fortunately to meet Sandy. Through her, I got many opportunities to learn about God. I was very curious about the Bible, and wonder why so many people follow Jesus Christ. And throughout my time here, God opened my eyes and heart to my need for Jesus Christ. So in early 2020, I accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior after being in Canada for about two years. Looking back. The first day I arrived in Canada, my daughter and I slept and ate on the floor. We didn't have enough money for a living. In the first winter, even my daughter and I didn't have snow boots because we faced serious financial problem. At the meantime, my father got cancer. My husband insisted on divorcing me. When I was unable to carry all these burdens, God guided me and carried me. At the beginning, I asked God, "Why did you choose me to come here? How could I face all this darkness?" God stayed with me, taught me, and brought wisdom to me. He listened to my words and answered my prayer one by one. That's what happened. After becoming God's child, I have daily joy and thankfulness, and am able to buy lots of veggies from grocery store. When I get food from Sandy, when I study ESL classes, when I can enjoy hiking together with my friends, there are so many other reasons for me. To be filled with joy and thankfulness. I want to share a small thing, but I can feel that it is a blessing from God. That is the power of praying. It happened in one day in March, late afternoon. I was moving to a new place and felt nervous. One reason is. Before I lived in Kando, now I live in an old house. The other reason is my car insurance increased almost two hundred dollar per month because my new place has a high steal、uh, rate for cars. I was shocked and worried, and prayed and talked with God, and God gave me a sense of peace because He promises to protect His children. And I was so nervous about my neighbors. After moving one week, someone knocked at the door. I was so worried and looked outside. Finally, I encouraged myself to open the door. There were four teens and one seven-year-old boy. 
they were very polite and began to introduce themselves. Even their little brother looked at us far away and waved hands, who looked like four years old. They were my closest neighbors. One family came from Italy, the other came from Israel. They came to welcome me. At that moment, my heart was singing. I felt so warm and touchable. I said, thank you, my mighty God. You have taken my fear away. God is everywhere. He used many things to remind me. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Romans chapter 9, verse 15. Today, I say thank you for listening to my testimony, and I praise God and dedicate my life and family to Him as I step forward to get baptized. Amen. Lillian, we are very glad and happy that you are here, and God has led you to this country and to this church, and we are just so thankful that uh, you are a part of the family of God now. And Lillian Zhang, because you have proclaimed your faith before God and all of these witnesses, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I now baptize you. Thank you, Alfred and Lillian, for sharing the story of Christ in your life. Let us continue our worship by singing Amazing Grace.
Hello, my name is Kayla Soon. Um, I've been at ESCOM for many years and I grew up in church for all my life. So I'm quite familiar with the gospel and the Bible stories for as long as I can remember. I remember very distinctly as a child wanting to not go to church and when I became an adult, uh, I would also imagine what I could be doing instead of going to church. Um, so I never believed in God. I thought it was something people held on to to feel good about themselves. Although I knew the fundamental points about the Bible, uh, which hasn't drastically changed now, none of it was rooted in a belief that the God it was describing was real. I thought that if I could just believe he existed, then all the amazing stories about Jesus and his saving grace and the Holy Spirit would fall into place and I could have lived a life of faith uh, that the Bible describes. It, it was really just something that I fantasized about, something um, like if I had wings, not something I actually thought would happen. It was around early high school while walking back to church from lunch when there was a sudden revelation that hit me like a bolt of lightning, that God was real and present, the same feeling you get when you uh, forget something. So I knew um, that uh, that's what it would take to for God to get to me. But even with that, even knowing uh, with what Jesus did on the cross was real, nothing really changed for me. I thought that I would live this holy life for God, but I was really enjoying my own life too much, um, that I didn't want to give anything up. I always acknowledged that I was a sinner, but not the worst one, and there's no expiration date to accept Jesus, so I was in no rush. Gradually, I started to worry about dying, and I really felt dissatisfied with where my life was headed. I was really afraid of what death would feel like and how nothing in my life would matter anymore. Uh, even then, I didn't want to turn to God. It was really a friend who was attending ESCOM at the time that sensed my paranoia um, and challenged me to think about why I don't want to turn to God, even if I know so much about him, so much about his love and his grace and his, and his wisdom and providence. There isn't a specific moment that I can say I accepted Jesus um, and became a Christian. It was a gradual process where God was really breaking down my pride and confronting my fear with his, with his love. Um, and that I started to believe in who he was. Um, and I guess that was around uh, grade 12. So the change is hardly noticeable. But now that so many years have passed, I can really see a huge difference from when I was just starting my relationship with God, um, interested but hesitant, to now where I have to be and want to be uh, fully committed to Him. Part of uh, this commitment is baptism. This is something that uh, is clearly commanded in the Bible and I have been actively disobeying for many years. Uh, I could have been baptized uh, years ago, but a tradition in our church is to share uh, our testimony and I really uh, don't want to do it. Uh, honestly, a lot of, it's a lot of people and it's very awkward, so selfishly I've been avoiding it. It is also something that I've been really struggling with God about. A God who, when I was still his enemy and actively denying him, would sacrifice his son, his most precious son for me, so that I could have this open channel of communication just to argue with him about it. Um, when I didn't want to hear it from God, he spoke through lots of people. And I hope many of you who are uh, watching, who are listening, know who you are and how thankful I am for your words of encouragement to tell me that I am just a vessel for his story and his awesomeness and that whatever I have, God will use and multiply for his glory. So when preparing for this baptism, Philippians 4, 6 to 7 was really encouraging. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, uh, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Jesus Christ. I'm still nervous, but... I believe in the words of God that he will give me peace over my petty worries uh, through the same dialogue of prayer. 
and I don't want to be disobedient uh, any longer. He has done everything for me in my life and, um, and has reached me in ways that are so unbelievable, but not always appreciated. And I know that he will also use this for his glory as well. Thank you. <sighs> Kayla, we are so thankful that you are here and we're very thankful to God that he has brought you to this place to be able to step into the, the uh, waters of baptism. And because you have proclaimed your faith before God and all of these witnesses, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I now baptize you. Praise the Lord and amen. Good morning. My name is Bart, and today I'll be sharing my testimony today. I grew up in a Christian family and went to a Christian school starting from SK to grade 8. Throughout that time, I learned about the Bible, God, and that praying was important. I went to church every week, but not because I wanted to, but um, because my parents went, so I went with them. I would pray and read the Bible every day, but I did not care about the meaning behind it. I did it for the marks and I thought as long as I was doing it, I would be saved. And when I prayed, it was about what I needed, but not what I was thankful for. My parents started teaching me about what it means to be a Christian by surrendering your life to God and accepting Jesus as my savior. So I accepted Christ at the age of six in the washroom, but I did not feel a connection with God. I did not try to live the way God wanted me to, and I was going through the motions of reading the Bible and praying. And most of the time I did it because it was worth marks for school, so I would do it just to get the 100. In grade nine, I left the Christian school and moved on to a public school. And this was my first time where I was not in a Christian environment and no one held me accountable for my Christian faith. While I still went to church, I was not living how God wanted me to live. Rather, I was living how a non-Christian would live. In grade 10, I decided to join Didomai because I realized I was moving further away from God. And from Didomai, I learned more about the purpose of praying, reading the Bible, and the importance of having a relationship with God. While I was learning how to live for God, I did not feel that God was with me for the most part. It was not until grade 12 when I had to apply for university. Because I had anxiety disorder, my grades were not meeting the minimum requirements for school and my life was more stressful than it was supposed to be. This was when I relied on God for the first time because there was nothing I could do if I went through this by myself and this was also the first time when I entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. This was also the first time that I felt that God was truly present in my life as he gave me strength and support from families and teachers, which helped me get into university at the end. I also struggled in the first two years of university because I was barely meeting the grade requirement for my program. I was experiencing a lot of stress at this time because I did not know what I wanted to do with my future. But thankfully, God led an elementary friend into my life who gave me tremendous support in university. Throughout my undergrad, he was there to help me with school-related work and was there to support me when I was struggling in so many other areas. I was very blessed and able to experience God's faithfulness in and through this friend. I haven't seen that in very many other people, but I am truly thankful that God works in and through others for his glory. So today I am here to proclaim Jesus as my Lord and Savior and to commit myself to obeying him in spite of all my needs and struggles. Amen. Bart Chang, because you have proclaimed your faith in Jesus Christ before God and all of these witnesses, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I now baptize you.
Hi, good morning, church. My name is Irene Le. I have been coming to this church for more than 10 years. When I look back, God has been very patient with me. I was born in Hong Kong. My parents followed the Chinese traditions and some uh, Buddhist practices. They raised me up uh, to behave well at home, at school, as well as a good member of the society. They expect me to do, uh, study hard at school, to get a good job, and to be independent. My primary school was run by a Buddhist organization. I learned about karma at a very young age, and I was taught about the principle of cause and effect, and that the intents and actions of an individual's present life will have an impact on his or her future life. My secondary school was run by an African church. There was a chapel at school. And my Christian classmates went there to pray. And during the daily morning assembly, we sang hymns, uh, we worshiped and prayed to God. But in my mind, all the religion taught me to be a good person. And Bible study is like another subject like English and maths. And the exam result make my report look better. After I graduated from university, I worked as a social worker. I enjoyed my job. I knew I did help people, though there were some situations that I could not change. I was a conscientious worker and a respectful colleague. I took care of my family. I did good out of my own efforts. And I believe in planning to make things happen. And if I try it hard enough, I will get what I want. And during those years, some friends invited me to their churches. I went out of courtesy and became disappointed uh, because of the behavior of some Christians. It so happened I have a chance to study in Montreal for a year. I did not know anyone there, but my friend's sister had studied there. So she connected me with some of her friends at the church and it was at Alliance Church. Life there was quiet, so I went to our church on Sunday and know more about Christianity. But after I returned back to Hong Kong, I went to church for a short period of time and then was distracted by the day-to-day -day hustles. The, become, uh, the coming of the uh, 1997 made a lot of people in Hong Kong to consider immigration. While I was debating should I give up everything and come to Canada, I remember the advice from one of my professors in Montreal. She told me to stay in a place that I can call, uh, come in and out freely. I did not know why I took her advice so serious, because at that point, Hong Kong was very peaceful and I traveled to a lot of countries without any restrictions. Now I know that God has been protecting me years ago from the present sudden and predicted uh, turmoil in Hong Kong. After I came back to Canada, I went to some church. Each time I stopped going when I did not feel the connection. But in my mind, I know that there's a God. But who is the true God? I've known Angelina Chow for years. One day we talked about our search for God. She told me that she was attending this church and suggested me to come. So I started to come for the Sunday worship and the small group. I know more about God's teaching. And I realized that no matter how hard I try, the dark side of me from time to time was out of control. So in 2014 summer, I decided to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Uh, I told Charles Mack, who was um, my small group leader then and now. So he helped me with the prayer to God to admit my uh, sin and to ask for his forgiveness and to accept him as my Lord and Savior. You may wonder why it takes so long for me to get baptized. My long, a long ongoing concept of doing good has been a huge roadblock for me. It's very hard for me to change from a self-directed life to a Christ-directed life. I want to be a, good, a better person before being baptized. Years ago, my father was diagnosed with dementia. 
He lived with me. It was very hard to handle his behavior. And up to a point, I have to get him to a long-term care facility. He has strong personality and was very resistant to staying in a long-term care facility. And as a social worker, I try everything I can to help him to settle down. I also pray to God to help me and my father. God is good, and it was really a miracle. All of a sudden, my father stopped asking to go back home and start to pay attention to the new living environment. I used to see him after work. One day, he asked me to leave because it was getting dark. I almost want to cry because I haven't heard such caring words from my father for years. I don't think that human efforts can make this change. He died a few months ago. As you know that during the pandemic, uh, we cannot visit him. Again, God showed his mercy. His health condition took a sharp decline during his last three weeks. We finally have to change his status to end of life. And under this condition, visitors were allowed. All of us have a chance to see him before he passed away. And this is especially important for my mom. When I look back, there, I haven't gone through any major upheaval in my life. That really is a blessing. But I also remember there was a few events that I want something and I faced challenges. And at the end, I got better outcome. In the past, I would say that because I work hard enough to get my goal. But now I can see the work and protection of God behind the scene. His love for me is not through drastic changes. His provision is good for me to face the day-to-day -day hustles. I don't know what my course of life is heading to, but I be believe the following two verses will help me to strengthen my faith in God. The verses are from the Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. In nothing be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. And make your request known to the God, the peace of God, which surpasses all understandings, regard your heart and thought in Christ Jesus. Thank you for listening to my testimony. All glory be to God. Amen. Irene, we are so thankful to God that you are here. And we really thank God for Angelina, who brought you here, and for Charles, who was your small group leader, who yeah. helped you to become a Christian. Yeah. And because today you have proclaimed your faith before God and all of these witnesses, mm -hmm. in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yeah. I now baptize you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb, Bart, and Irene for sharing your heart with us. Let us continue our worship by singing your glory.
Tim, Lori, and Adrian for leading us in songs of worship this morning. Now is the time for intercessory prayer. Let us knit our hearts together before God. Heavenly Father, in the midst of your Easter holiday, we cannot help but be thankful for the hope, joy, and renewal that it signifies. Because of your great love for us, though we are sinners, you did not spare even your only son, subject to a humiliating and brutal death, if that meant we could be reconciled to you. May we constantly remember the weight of your great sacrifice so that we can live out our purpose while we are here on earth. Thank you for this long weekend so that we can take time to reflect, pray, enjoy, and be grateful. As we look around us, it is springtime, and you have blessed us with new beginnings, new life, and a new season. May your dynamic spirit renew ours as we allow you to continuously transform our hearts and renew our minds. We pray for Tiffany and Nicholas Lee and big sister Maddie as they are expecting the arrival of their baby any day now. May you calm any anxiety in terms of logistics, timing, and babysitting. We pray for a safe and uncomplicated home labor and delivery. May you surround Tiffany and baby with your angels. We continue to pray for our government and public health professionals 
as we enter another lockdown due to the rising cases of COVID. Lord, may you grant them your divine wisdom, courage, leadership, and integrity to make the best decisions for the people of our province and nation. We pray for our essential workers as they go to work every day. We are indebted to their service, sacrifice, and dedication during this pandemic, and all of the extra burden in order to ensure safety and public health. We lift up those who have been suffering due to illness, loss of loved ones, isolation. May you enable us to care for them and bring them hope during this dark time. You see them. Open our eyes to see them too. For you have collected all their tears in a bottle. Each and every one you know and is precious in your sight. We thank you for our faithful deacons and elders who have been serving ESCOM in our church ministries. For those stepping down, may you grant them rest and renewal and enjoyment of a new season in their walk with you. For those continuing on, may you grant us new strength, perseverance, vision, unity, and joy in our service. Lord, we are so grateful that even in this time, we are able to connect with other small groups and fellowships. We thank you for our youth counselors, Joelle, Tim, Freddie, Tuan, Brian, Andy, Joanna, Caleb, Michael, and Nathan. It is a joy to see their love for our youth pouring into the younger generation and being role models. We thank you for their efforts in making weekly and bi-weekly fellowship meetings possible and that it is a forum for our youth to come together, interact and share with one another. Thank you for this long weekend. May we take the time to reflect and celebrate your greatest act of love. We pray all this in your beloved son, Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning, ESCOM. My name is Andy, and today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 11. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance to, with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, good morning again, everyone, and happy Easter to all of you. Can you believe that we've been in a COVID shutdown for a little over a year now? And finally, finally, we are allowed to have baptisms in the church. Wow. And so I say congratulations to Alfred and to Lillian, to Kayla, to Bart, and to Irene for your wonderful testimonies and how you have proclaimed your faith in Jesus Christ in front of your spiritual family. Congratulations, because this is a very special day because we are celebrating Easter Sunday. And today we have a most excellent and a very fitting passage for us to look at on Easter Sunday because there are a lot of people in this world who, who look at us Christians and they think we're a bunch of weirdos, a bunch of quacks. And, and, and they think in their mind, why would you ever believe in writings that are so old and ancient? 
hundreds of years and even thousands of years old. Come on, let's get with it, you bunch of Christians. How can you put your life on the line for such an ancient book? Well, I mean, for us as Christians, we face these kinds of attitudes and questions all the time. And um, the last time someone asked me with that kind of sentiment uh, about my belief in the Bible, I simply say to the person, well, friend, well, so-and-so, can I ask you, have you ever read anything in the Bible yourself, personally? And a lot of times they say, no, I haven't read anything about it. And and so I encourage them not to be so critical and close-minded to something they've actually never read. And every once in a while, I encounter someone who actually says, yes, I've read many parts of the Bible. And And I smile because it now becomes an opportunity for me to engage with them in a conversation about truth and about spiritual matters. You see, most people who come to the Bible and they read a few verses of it, they find it very difficult to understand. And I think it's true. I can affirm that it's true. I mean, all Christians and even for me and all of us as pastors or workers in the, in the kingdom of God, there are many parts of the Bible that we find very, very difficult to understand. But if there is a God and if we are on a genuine search to find truth, We fully believe that if there's such a true God, He will make it possible for us to find the truth that He has provided. And so we are always on a genuine search for truth and and, and for um, spiritual insights on how to live. And, And we congratulate the five baptized candidates because they have found the truth. They have found it in Jesus Christ. And so again, we say congratulations to them. Today on Easter Sunday, we are looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. And if you didn't know, these 11 verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I mean, they are foundational and they are the bedrock of our Christian faith and our Christian heritage. And I'm going to take a few minutes to to try to explain this passage um, before I draw a few conclusions. Now, I've never been to Greece. I don't know if you have, and if you have, I say congratulations, but most people who go to Greece, there's one city they always want to visit. They want to visit Athens. Athens is supremely known for academia and philosophy and culture and politics, and it is the the place where all world thinkers, they've evolved from or or been there or have studied there in, in Athens. And so for thousands of years, Athens is the place for world thinkers to gather, to talk about culture, to talk about religion, to talk about politics, to talk about many things in life, philosophy. And Athens happens to be the city in which Paul went there in Acts chapter 17, and he presented Jesus Christ to all the intelligentsia of the entire Greek-speaking world in Athens. And Paul did a really, really good job in presenting Jesus Christ. And he, Paul even compliments some of the, the, the people in Athens for, for the Greek poets that he was quoting. And so Paul did an excellent job until until he started to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 17 and verse 32. And in that verse, it says that the people started to mock Paul. They started to sneer at Paul because they were not open to the possibility of Paul preaching and teaching and speaking about Jesus Christ who resurrected from the dead. Oh no, they were not open to that at all. And so they started to, 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 to sneer and to mock Paul after that. Not, well, not everybody, but many of them did. Now, why do I tell you about the city of Athens? It's because the city of Corinth was very, very close to Athens. The city of Corinth, I mean, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians to the church of, in the city of Corinth. I mean, the city of Corinth was so influenced by the big city, Athens. And so the Christians in the church of Corinth, they really needed some strong teaching, some grounding in the truth and in the word of God. And that is exactly what the Apostle Paul gave to them 
in the book of 1 Corinthians, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Thank you, Andy, for reading those verses for us earlier. So let's begin uh, looking at this passage by looking at verses 1 to 4 here. I mean, listen to these words. Look at these words if you have your devices. Verse 1, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Okay, pop quiz time. I give a pop quiz every once in a while. What is the gospel? How would you define or how would you describe and summarize the gospel in in a very simple way? I mean, what is the gospel? If you are a Christian, you should know. I mean, how can we spread the gospel if we don't even know what it is? And so here in, in our passage, I mean, if you're not sure of how to define or describe the gospel, if you don't know what it is, just take a glance down at at verses 3 and 4, because Paul could not have put it in more simple terms. And and when we analyze and reflect on verses 3 and 4, all it takes really is five words, five, five words to summarize the gospel. Based on verses 3 and 4, Jesus died and rose again. Jesus died and rose again. Jesus died and rose again. Now, there's five words. (laughs) See, that's the gospel. Jesus died and rose again. Um, And and that's the, the foundation and the bedrock of our Christian faith and heritage. Paul is very, very clear in verses 1 to 2 that he as a spokesperson for God, as a writer of the, of the word of God, as an apostle, as, a, as an apostle, I mean, to forsake what Paul is preaching and teaching, to forsake the, what's, what the gospel is of Jesus Christ, I mean, to reject it, to forsake it, to ignore his teachings, and to look for answers outside of these. I mean, it is to believe in vain. That's what Paul is telling us in verses 1 and 2. Instead, Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to hold fast to his message, which is of first and prime importance. So we ask, you know, why should anyone believe in this message that Paul is giving? Why should anyone believe in the word that that, that Paul is writing here? Because, well, well, why believe? Well, because Paul what Paul has written is absolutely true. It's verified and affirmed. He says at the end of verse 3 that Jesus Christ died according to the Scriptures for our sins. Wow. Jesus Christ died in accordance with the Scriptures for our sins? That should be very interesting and fascinating. You see, Paul was thinking about the Old Testament prophecies, and perhaps he was thinking about Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 9. And this prophecy written by Isaiah was written 700 years ago before Jesus Christ ever came to be on this earth. I mean, take a look at Isaiah 53, uh, and I'll just read verses 5 to 6. But he was talking about the Messiah that would be sent. But he, the Messiah, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This happens to be the same reference that Elder Andrew spoke about in his midweek devotional on Wednesday. I mean, I only read a part of it, but that was the same reference. You see, the fact that Jesus Christ died is undeniable. 
It's undeniable. But he died the kind of death that was written about 700 years ago, described by Isaiah throughout the book of Isaiah, but especially in chapter 53. So it takes no faith to believe in this undeniable fact of history that Jesus Christ died. Jesus Christ's burial proves he died, but it does take faith to believe that Jesus Christ actually rose again and came to life from the dead. I mean, to believe in the miraculous bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now that, my friends, that takes great faith. People don't just come back from the dead, from a grave, 36 hours after they've been dead and buried. It just doesn't happen. (laughs) A few weeks ago in our Sunday series, uh, we saw Lazarus who was raised to life by Jesus Christ. He had already been buried for three days, and it was more than that when, he, when they opened the grave. I mean, the, the, the sisters, uh, Mary and Martha, were worried about the stink that would, t- would come out of this grave because he had been there for over 36 hours already. But Jesus Christ raised him from the dead as a foreshadow of Jesus himself being resurrected. So why, I mean, how can we Christians believe in this kind of thing? I mean, was it a story? Was it fiction? Or was it real? Was it fact of life? Well, let me tell you, it was real. It was not a made up story. I mean, let's look again back into our passage in 1 Corinthians and take a look at why we are so sure that it's a fact of history. Look at verses 5 to 8 with me in 1 Corinthians 15. Well, actually, I'll begin in verse 3. For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared, the resurrected Jesus appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep or they've died. Uh, since since he wrote this. And then verse 7, Then the resurrected Jesus appeared to James, and then to all of the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, the resurrected Jesus also appeared to me. That's what Paul writes here in verses uh, 3 to 8 here. So we read that. I, I, I mean, Jesus appeared to over five hundred people who saw with their own eyes the resurrected Jesus. I I mean, he appeared to Cephas or to Peter. He appeared to the twelve. He appeared to over 500 brothers and who knows how many women and children were there. Most of them were still alive at the time of Paul's writing. That's important to note. And then Jesus appeared to James, to all the apostles, and finally to the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. If you don't know much about the apostle Paul, I mean, he used to be a staunch persecutor of Christians, and he went on the hunt to hunt down Christians, to arrest them, to persecute them, to put them in prison. He wanted to annihilate this Jesus movement that took place in that area. That is, until the Apostle Paul met Jesus face to face in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus, and he got converted to Jesus Christ. And most of us know that, I I mean, the result. uh, Paul writes, take a look at what he says in verses 8 to 11 to continue the story. Verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 15 to 11. Last of all, as one untimely born, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me, whether it was I or they, So we preach, and so you all believed. Wow. Paul is 
writing from a very personal perspective here in verses 8 to 11. And, and he tells us about what the resurrected Christ meant to him personally. And, and, and let's notice here that Paul was very, very humble. He didn't used to be. He was a braggart and a killer, but now he's very, very humble. And, and he says that all the other apostles were great soldiers, but Paul says of himself that he was like a premature baby, a preemie, who did not submit to Jesus Christ yet until Acts chapter 9, where he got converted after seeing and experiencing Jesus Christ for himself. And so when we look at the Apostle Paul, it is truly amazing how the resurrection of Jesus Christ radically and permanently changed the life trajectory of the Apostle Paul. It was changed, his life tra trajectory, it was changed for the glory of God. He once viciously persecuted Christians and tried to annihilate the church. And he knew that he was unfit for salvation, uh, but he received a calling from God. He was granted a conversion to God. And Paul rightly attributed this calling and, to, and this ministry that he's involved with now, as he writes, all to the unmerited grace of God. There's nothing Paul did that, 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 that he should deserve this grace from God. Um, so we, we, we look at this, this passage, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 11, written by the Apostle Paul. And after understanding these 11 verses, it's easy to come to a conclusion based on these verses. And I think the conclusion that we can draw this morning is very simple. The resurrection of Jesus Christ validates the core beliefs of our Christian faith. That's what we conclude. The resurrection of Jesus Christ validates the core beliefs of our Christian faith. What core beliefs am I talking about? Well, I, I mean, we can easily conclude that the Bible is truly reliable. It is. It's true. It's accurate. The Messiah came just as it was written, exactly as it was written and foretold. That was Jesus. He came. Another core belief is that Jesus Christ is supreme. Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. The resurrection proves that because he overcame death. Death had no hold on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is victorious over death and darkness. And perhaps another core belief of our Christian faith that is affirmed by the resurrection is, is simply that we are promised a future resurrection for us as children of God, a future resurrection in which we will be granted eternal life in heaven after Jesus comes back. Friends, I think it is safe for me to declare that Christianity is not a religion. It's not a religion. I mean, it's not a relig religion in the sense that a religion is based on rules and regulations. And if you follow those rules and do those regulations, you are okay with God. No, 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 no. Instead, Christianity is not a religion, but Christianity is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It is a relationship with God through the resurrected Christ. God gives us grace and power to overcome the darkness. And the resurrection power that brought Jesus back to life is the same resurrection power that we have access to. Why do I say that? Because for every true child of God, it's the promise of God in Scripture that He will send His Holy Spirit to dwell and to take residence within our internal body and soul. I mean, God gives us His personal Holy Spirit so that there would be godly changes that would take place in the life of a true Christian from the inside out. We can be radically transformed as children of God if we are true Christians. And, and, and I hope you can see these changes in the Apostle Paul. There are radical changes from the inside out. And those changes that took place in the Apostle, in the Apostle Paul, 
They should be the very same kind of changes that each and every one of us as children of God, as followers of Jesus that we should experience. So again, let's notice the changes of Paul. The first change that Paul was his, his new sense of humility. I mean, Paul is eliminating all of his human pride, all of his degrees, all of his successes. Look at verse 9 with me. It says, he says that, Paul says that he is the least of the apostles. Wow, are you kidding me? No, really. Paul the apostle, he wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament, and he humbly says, that he is the least of all of the apostles. Wow, wow, what a humble, humble man, full of humility, just like Jesus Christ. Another huge change that we see in the apostle Paul is his whole view of grace. I mean, it's clear that everything that Paul accomplished, and and he reflects that in verse 10, he didn't deserve to accomplish anything but it was all granted to him by the grace and by the goodness of God. And I don't know if you pick this up at the end of this passage, but let's notice Paul's deep love and appreciation and support for the work of other people in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I mean, in verse 11, he says, whether it was I or whether it was they, it didn't matter any longer to Paul. The gospel was preached and the people in the church of Corinth believed. That's what Paul was. He was such a team player now. Isn't that what we need more of in in today's world? We need resurrection power so that we might become more humble, that we become more gracious, that we become more helpful and supportive of one another in the church. No more disunity, no more arguing, no more bickering, but a great unity recognizing the team that God has assembled on this earth. Well, to the newly baptized, to Alfred, to Lillian, to Kayla, to Bar, to Irene, we say congratulations again. And to them and to all of us here this morning, may we allow the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to reign supreme in all of us so that we would be transformed from the inside out for the glory of God. Let's close in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for your mercy and thank you for your grace. But most of all, thank you for Jesus Christ, who you promised to send, who you did send, and whom voluntarily allowed himself to be put to death so that we might have a way to come back to you, the one true God. Now may you continue to be merciful to us as we respond in song. We thank you now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mr. Victor for the message. Let us respond by saying, I stand amazed.
Thank you, Laurie and Tim and Adrian, for leading us in that very appropriate response song. We now come to the time of communion, and communion is a time of reflection. It's a time of confession. It is a time of celebration as we seek to get right with God and right with one another. Today, I'd like to read two passages to us. We're going to put them on the screen. The first passage comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 24. And the second passage becomes from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 25. And many of you are familiar with these passages. But let me read Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 24. Then he, Jesus, said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. It is clear that Every follower of Jesus Christ, every child of God has a cross to carry. And Jesus says that we have to carry this cross every day. And so it should not surprise us that God allows trials and sufferings and difficulties into our lives. Sometimes He allows them, sometimes He even sends them. Why? So that we might trust and turn to Him and not rely on our own strength, but to walk in His grace and in His Spirit. And I love this passage that Paul identifies the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit that the Spirit wants to emanate from our inside out. It's the character of Jesus Christ Himself. So as we reflect on Easter Sunday and communion time and these passages today, we have to ask ourselves, how is your relationship with God? How is my relationship with God? How are our relationships with other people? Is it in good shape? Is it in decent shape? Is it in great and excellent shape? Or have some of us lost our way? Because today on Easter Sunday at this communion time, this really is the time and the place to reflect, to confess, and to get right with God and right with one another. So, I'd like us to spend a few moments in silent prayer and meditation. Spend some time meditating on some of the things we've talked about today to reflect about our life in front of God. And what do we need to confess and what do we need to repent from? What do we need to depend more of so that we might be right with God and right with one another? So let's bow our heads now and have a time of silent meditation. And I'll close this time of silent prayer off in just a few moments.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that the resurrected Christ, he affirmed everything that we believe and our trust in you and our reliability on the word of God as your directives to all of us on this earth. Thank you for Jesus, for his willingness to allow himself to be crucified, put to death, not for his sins, but for our sins and the sins of this world so that we might have a way to come back to you. So Lord, we've confessed our sins. We've acknowledged our need. We are not worthy of anything, but because we believe in Jesus, he makes us worthy. So we pray for your blessing upon this bread and upon this cup, the bread that represents the body of Christ, the cup that represents the blood of Christ, because there is no forgiveness without these. So thank you and may you bless them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. So now let us take the bread and the cup. Amen, amen. It is now time for our announcements, ESCOM, Love in Action. Good morning, church. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And as Christians, we have been so blessed to be the recipient of Christ's ultimate love in action where he did not spare even his own life so that we can be redeemed. And so today I invite you um, as followers of Jesus Christ um, to join in our love and action here at ESCOM um, to our neighbors and to the people outside of our ESCOM walls. As you know, April is outreach and missions combined um, for love and action. So I invite you, if you haven't done so already, to register for our trivia night that's coming up. And um, all the funds raised will go towards our very own Kevin, Carol, Marcus, and Mackenzie as they serve faithfully in Cambodia. So please register and it will be a fun night of trivia. Um, I think, you know, bragging rights are, are what we're going for here. My family's already registered, so we hope to see you there. Also, we have a prayer line, which will be happening on the second Saturday evening of April. Again, we just want to have a space for us to come to, to be prayed for, and just to allow um, us to bless you with a prayer. And also, we have our partnership with Christie Refugee Center, and we, we are putting together gift baskets to, to give to refugees who have come um, to Canada to seek refuge. I'm still looking for around 20 people who will pack um, these Easter gift bags. It's not really, I'm not really looking for baskets, gift bags. And so those of you who have contacted me and asked me some really good questions, and this is something that you pack on your own at home and just drop off at church and we will deliver it um, to Christie Christi Refugee Center. Finally, we have also out of the cold, Sam Mack is the one who is in charge of this and he wants people to come to church. And so we're looking for 10 volunteers to come to church and pack the sandwich bags together with him. And so right now I have five people registered. So we're still looking for five more people and so I hope that you really um, feel encouraged to want to take part in this Love in Action April initiative. Thank you for listening to this announcement. Thank you, Eileen, for your wonderful announcements every week. And now it is time to receive the benediction. So let us bow our heads and close in prayer and benediction. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your amazing grace and the gift of Jesus Christ. May his resurrected power 
be in all of us. And now to the King eternal, to the King immortal, to the King invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And all of God's people say together, Amen, Amen. And again, congratulations to Alfred and to Lillian, to Kayla, to Bart, to uh, Irene, and to all of us. Happy Easter, and may many more people in the days ahead come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Have a great weekend. God bless you all.